So then uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce um, the first speaker. It uh, feels good to stand here this morning. Um, so uh, this talk is going to kind of give a easy introduction to machine learning. And, and I will uh, start by looking into more traditional machine learning methods and then moving to move into deep learning, which is the new algorithms that are revolutionizing the field as we speak. So NR um, used to be the only place in Norway where you could find a computer. Uh, and that was a good business model uh, 70 years ago. Uh, but now we do uh, research in statistical analysis. And I, uh, as Greta said, work with image analysis. So in image analysis, we want to make algorithms that can um, give us the content of images and locate objects in images. And um, of course, we don't work with dogs and cats. Uh, we work with uh, a bunch of different kind of data, like uh, cancer images, um, aerial photos, marine photos, and some subsurface photos. Um, and I will get back to some of these later. So in machine learning, we typically have uh, some input data and we have some output data uh, that we want. So we want to have the algorithm that can take us from some input data and give us some output that has more value to us uh, of, for some reason. So uh, since we're uh, talking about subsurface, this might be um, a well log that we want to, instead of uh, looking into the core samples from the well, uh, maybe we want to try to make an algorithm that can take us directly from the well log to the lithology. Um, or another example, as I'm sure we will see um, later today, is that we have our seismic data and we want to go from this to uh, some interpretation. Maybe we want to find some faults or salt body. Uh, and the main assumption behind doing machine learning is that there is a, a relationship between our input data and our output data. Um, and, and actually, this is, uh, should not take this for granted, for, because sometimes people want to do machine learning uh, when there really is no connection between the output data and the input data. But that's the fundamental assumption, that there are some relationship. Uh, sometimes we need uh, experts to to, uh, to do this transition, sometimes uh, we have some physics uh, that can take us from the input to the output. But um, when the physics is unknown or if the experts are expensive or the interpretation is boring, then uh, we can try to solve this with machine learning. So then we're trying to figure out, the goal of machine learning is to figure out the relationship between the input data and the output data. Um, and, the, and the simplest case that we have here is, is the linear regression. So we have a lot of samples where we know the input value, we know the output value, and we're trying to figure out what connects the input and the output. So um, during my PhD, I worked a lot of, uh, on salt bodies. And the traditional way of finding, yeah, so you have a salt body here, uh, which is uh, located below this strong reflection over here. And typically, you want to make a 3D model of the salt, so you, want to in, you have to interpret the salt in many of these slices. Uh, and uh, instead of doing that manually, you could use machine learning to automate it. So. <clears throat> The standard way would be to uh, compute some features and then apply a classifier. So if we take a look at this image, we see that the pixel value here don't give us much information about uh, what the salt body is and uh, what is not the salt body. Uh, so the, pic the pixel values, the amplitudes, they range from 
let's say minus one to one, and, and there is no information in just one pixel. So we have to look at a small neighborhood to figure out what the content of, of a small region is. Uh, and this is what we do with the features. Uh, we, we have a small window and we compute some uh, measure of what we see inside this small window. So that could be, uh, uh, for instance, the standard deviation gives us uh, information about energy inside this uh, image, or um, we could compute some coherence attribute. Uh, <coughs> so, so the features are a way for us to extract uh, or highlight the important information in the input image. And uh, the classifier then should take these features uh, one pixel at a time and uh, predict whether the, the center pixel of this window is uh, a salt body or not. So uh, when we have a classifier, we have to train it. So typically then we have some label data, which we have here. So we have the blue part, uh, 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 not a geologist, uh, but me have uh, labeled that as not salt. And the red part is then labeled as salt. And we have a new data set uh, where we don't have an interpretation. So what we do is that we compute the features uh, for each of these data sets. Now, if we take uh, the features and plot them against each other, so we take each pixel, collect the feature values, uh, we can plot them as a function of each other. Now, this is called the feature space. And we see that in this feature space, we get some relationship between the two classes. So we see that the salt pixels, they have high coheren uh, low coherency, and they have uh, low energy. So they cluster in one, one uh, side of this feature space. And the pixels that are outside the salt cluster in a, another place of this uh, feature space. And, and uh, when we're <coughs> training a classifier, the goal is just to draw a line between these two clusters. So the simplest classifier uh, I can think of is just to estimate the mean values of each cluster and then draw a straight line between them. And uh, we can use this classifier on, our, uh, on the other data set to separate salt and not salt. So that's a very simple classifier. Uh, we have, oh, here's a, a bit more advanced a neural network, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. And, and this consists of, uh, we have our input features on the right here. We have a layer of units. And each unit uh, takes the input and applies a weight to each of the inputs and sum them. And let's see, maybe we can start this. So what we do is that we gradually tune the weights in order for uh, the accuracy of our training data to, to, uh, to increase. And we find this decision boundary between the two classes. Uh, there are a bunch of these classifiers. And uh, they all uh, have different properties. And they all draw some line in this feature space. Uh, and the work on classifier has, classifiers has been uh, very good lately. Um, but the, the problem is when the features are bad. Where should you draw the line here? So if we have simple images uh, like this, it's very easy to compute nice features. Uh, for instance, shape and color will be enough to separate bananas from oranges. But if the images looks like this, or if the images are seismic images, it's not that easy to compute features. <clears throat> so the classifier is good, but the feature engineering can be a problem. <coughs> Sometimes. Sometimes this works very well. So uh, in deep learning, we replace the entire classification uh, feature plus classification pipeline with a, a convolutional neural network, a CNN. So that's a neural network, uh, like I showed you before. 
but it has one change, and that is that it's uh, convolutional. So the input to the algorithm is the amplitude data, uh, the image directly. And instead of having these um, neurons that weights the inputs and sum them, uh, the neurons are now convolutions. So I have a, I'm just going to quickly show you what a convolution is. So then we have our input data, which is the uh, red box here, and we have some filter, which is the yellow box. And we put the filter on top of the input data, and we compute the uh, pixel-wise multiplication, and uh, sum them, and that's one pixel in the output image. So we run this filter th uh, over the entire input image, and we get a uh, image, uh, filtered image as our output. And <clears throat> this is the, the idea behind convolutional network. Each of these layers uh, consists of convolutions. And instead of training the weights uh, that we had in the, in the normal neural network, uh, we train the filter coefficients, these yellow boxes. <clears throat> so, uh, what we see uh, when we apply these kind of algorithms to normal images is that uh, in the first layer we typically learn to detect uh, low-level features like edges of different orientations. And then deeper into the network these edges are put together to form higher-level features. And in the end we have uh, high-level features that can separate between our classes uh, that we want to, to classify. <clears throat> so, deep learning has uh, been a revolution in, uh, in computer vision. We have this uh, very famous contest, uh, contest, which is called the ImageNet, uh, that consists of uh, 1.4 million uh, of these images of, of 1,000 different classes. And before deep learning, uh, the best results had like a 75% accuracy. And then after just two years with uh, these deep learning methods, we are approaching human performance on, on uh, doing this classification. So that's a, a quite uh, significant increase. So the, the problem with uh, these deep learning, uh, uh, deep neural networks is that they require a lot of training data. And they're easy to overfit. So, so they're not always uh, better than traditional methods. Uh, but if you have a lot of data, uh, then they can certainly do a lot better. Uh, and uh, these convolutional networks are pushing what we know as artificial intelligence. So when we have these our phone can talk to us and understand us. It's a convolutional network that has learned the relationship between speech and meaning that uh, run this technology. Uh, but it's all based on finding the relationship between the input data and the output data. So um, I thought I, I was going to spend the last time just showing some of the stuff that we do at NR. Um, so, yeah, we have this slide where we have um, the big companies have a lot of data and they get a, a good performance. And uh, our customers and our data are not that abundant. So we try to bring the same uh, performance increase to, to uh, other types of data. So uh, one of the first experiments that my colleagues did on, uh, on deep learning at NR was uh, they were contacted by some biologists from the University of Tromsø that has had these uh, wildlife camera boxes that they put into the forest and small animals w would run into the box and the box takes a, a picture of the animal. And they wanted to have an algorithm that could separate the different types of small animals. So we only got 1500 uh, different uh, images <coughs> And uh, one very classic way of, of um, solving this problem is to use a pre-trained network. So this is called transfer learning. 
so we have our network that has been trained on ImageNet and learned uh, how to detect feature, uh, faces and cats and dogs. And we freeze the first part of the network and only train the final part of the network. So then we use these low-level features that we can clearly can make use of for, for this case as well. And we only train the last layer, hopefully, to, to separate between these different types of animals. And uh, the results were uh, quite good. I think my colleague, he was a bit shocked. He, he spent just a few hours getting this up and running, and he spent a few days uh, re, re going through the code because he didn't believe the results. Um, so we got 98% uh, accuracy on, on this. And uh, when we looked at the misclassification, they were typically uh, images where you had snow or grass or just saw the tail of an animal. So that was quite successful. But this is a very easy case because we have the same box, we have the same lightning. The only thing that changes is the animal inside. So it's a really standardized uh, setup, and we don't have that for other types of image images. So <clears throat> another project we're doing with the Marine Research Institute uh, is uh, counting seals. So they have to assess the population of seals every year in, um, in the northern areas, and they go out every now and then with a helicopter and take photos of the ice uh, like this. And you can see on the red box, maybe, there is a seal. So they have to look through all of these images and count the seals. So the goal were then to uh, <coughs> make an algorithm that could uh, count seals from these photos. So uh, we sat down together with uh, uh, IMR and um, made, uh, found 100,000 training images, 10,000 with seals and 90,000 without seals. And we trained uh, a deep neural network uh, on this data. So the results were quite good as well. Uh, apparently, at least, the, the accuracy is very high. But <clears throat> the problem is that there are very, very few seals. So we maybe uh, um, only one of uh, 100 or 1,000 images are seals. So even if the accuracy is high, uh, we still have a lot of uh, misclassifications, like here. So only I think only 10% of the uh, seals that we find are really seals. So you still have to do a manual uh, selection of, of seals. Um, here's another one uh, where the mapping authorities wanted us to find forest roads that are not... Uh, um, uh, in any maps. So uh, then we had uh, the input data was an uh, uh, elevation model that we found from laser scanning with, with uh, airborne laser scanning. Uh, and we took the derivative of this uh, elevation model. That's a very common step to do. And you see that the road pops out. And we trained a segmentation network. So uh, when we have a segmentation network, the input image is an image, and the output is an image. Uh, <clears throat> and we have these uh, skip connections between the input images uh, and, and the output decoder to keep the resolution or to, uh, yeah. So uh, the results there are also somewhat good and somewhat bad as well. <laughs> we have some uh, missing uh, links here that uh, the network aren't able to connect. And we also have problem with rivers. They look a lot like roads. <coughs> so uh, another project we're doing with the metrology department, they measure the um, pollution in Oslo on a very coarse grid. So you have the Oslo Fjord here, and you have Songsvann and uh, Maadalsvanne up there. And what we're doing for them is that we're counting cars. So in, in Oslo, of course, they have good estimates of how many cars that are on each of the different roads. But uh, they want to apply this in China, 
where they don't count cars as much. So we're counting cars uh, using deep learning, and they're using this estimate to refine the pollution model. So we're redistributing the pollution along the roads. Uh, we have one uh, subsurface uh, project with Equinor. Uh, so that's a bit more related to the topic today, where we're trying to uh, find key horizons. Uh, that's a, quite a hard project. And uh, finally, we, uh, we recently got the research, big research project together with uh, the Marine, Marine Research Institute, uh, where we're going to do deep learning on marine data. <coughs> And the goal of that project is really to figure out how you can deal with uh, marine data where you don't have as much labels. Um, the images look quite different than our typically dog and cat image. And so on. Yeah, so we have some problems we are trying to tackle. Yeah, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, next time, I think. <laughs> okay. <clears throat>